Well, as I pointed out, the subject of causation has been a vexing one, and it has hosted its share of ideas, some quite uh, original, some quite odd. And it was the age of Newton, it was the 17th century, uh, and action at a distance, and the laws of mechanics, and what Galileo was doing in Padua, that finally got the community we'd refer to as the scientific community to abandon all inquiries into any mode of causality except what Aristotle meant by an efficient cause, by some antecedent event reliably bringing about a succeeding event. Now what made Hume's position so interesting and controversial is that heretofore one understood that the relationship between the antecedent and the consequent, between the quote cause and the effect, was nothing less than a necessary connection expressive of a universal law. That is to say, absent Hume's analysis, the understanding was that when we made these observations, we were finding something actually at work in the natural world. It was a mode of discovery. And of course, by the time Hume was finished with his analysis of causation, it turned out to be rather a habit of the mind. It, we are simply constituted in such a way that when we get these reliable pairings of antecedents and consequences, by way of the laws of association, we simply come to regard the antecedent as causally responsible for the consequent, notwithstanding to the contrary that there's nothing accessible to us at the level of sensation that is a cause. We don't see a cause. We don't see that power that is presupposed by a causal agent bringing things about. So he presents a successful or seemingly successful argument, not only against the idea that we have a knowledge of causal powers, he brings a rather successful argument against the proposition that the term power has any meaning at all. Now, if you want to blame someone for this in the 17th century, Descartes is usually a convenient target for almost anything, but Descartes did very much to establish mechanistic modes of explanation as the right kind of explanation, as, as did Galileo, and to a lesser extent, Newton himself, and Boyle, and we might say a fair number of those who founded or were fellows of the Royal Society from 1660 on. Still, there was much at the level of speculation regarding the nature of causality. So early in the 18th century, Leibniz actually summarizes and critically assesses what still stand on the books as the three primary theoretical entities to account for relationships we regard as causal. First he considers what's called the physicus influxus. Now, you might think that this is entirely passe, but it, it actually isn't. How does billiard ball one get billiard ball to move? Well, there must be something in one that actually enters into two and transmits to two what it was that one had that got one going in the first place. There, there's an actual physical influx of something from the antecedent into the consequent. And uh, you can use audiovisual aids in case you have skeptical students. You can say something like, if you look up here, it's a physical influxus, and it's, it's as if in my doing this, I render more credible an account that actually should be raising eyebrows. You know, it's an influxus, that sort of thing. Leibniz is among the first to say there's a problem with this. If something's going to continue to be moved, you're going to have to have a very large supply of this stuff. And the question is, where is the antecedent getting all of it that it is, that it that it infuses or somehow influxes into the consequent. But that, that was one account. And you say, well, certainly no serious person uh, associated himself with that idea. 
Well, I regard Hobbes as a serious person, Pierre Gassendi, Robert Boyle, they all stood behind me, physicus in fluxus. Then there was occasionalism, which rejects the possibility of any object causing a change in some different object. The motto here being that finite substances have no causal powers. Ah, well then how do these things happen? They happen because God is the cause of all things, and God's entrance into the world of happenings is such as to make the causal laws of nature operate unfailingly the way they do. It is the occasional entry of the divine intelligence, the divine plan into the order of nature. Nicholas Malebranche would be among the uh, more famous of the occasionalists. And then there was Leibniz's own view, his own theory, the theory of pre-established harmony. As it happens, the cosmos is just set up in such a way as to be orderly, and that order is preserved by lawful relationships, and lawful relationships are grounded in fundamental relationships between and among objects. At the level of discourse, we might call these causal interactions, but in fact, if we could take the long view, one might say the divine view, you, you would see that actually the entire cosmic layout is a harmonic one, such that mind-body relationships are not causal. Rather, there's a mental life. You might think of it as a clock. And there's a physical life, and you might think of it as a clock. They're simultaneously wound, you know, by the great clockmaker. So they run down their spring loading in perfect parallel fashion. It looks causal from the outside, but it's not causal. And it's not causal in part for the fundamental reason that mind as an unextended, non-located something can't be physically influenced by matter in motion. So how then to account for the relationship between body and mind? Well, in terms of simultaneously wound clocks, a pre-established harmony between the two, etc. So those were, the, those, those were the theories on offer, and you can see why Hume's approach was something of a house cleaning effort to say, look, a pox on all these houses. Uh, if we have an idea of causality, then that idea comes to us the way all ideas come to us, and that is by way of impressions, of which there are two kinds. There are impressions of sense, and there are impressions of reflection. And at the level of sensation, we have no evidence of causes, we have no evidence of causal powers. What do we have evidence of? We have evidence of highly reliable correlations between certain pairs of events. Now, common to many of the positions on the question of causality is this idea that some form of power stands behind the causal event. And this does put empiricism on notice because if you grant Hume's claim, and a more modified version of that claim is found in Locke as well, if you grant the claim that we have no sensory commerce with causal powers as such, and yet there are causal powers, well then this must be an idea that is not dependent on impressions of sense, etc. So you begin to see what? A movement toward innate ideas or some kind of a priori truth that's available to us because of our standing as rational beings. So, so the dive-in-the-wool empiricist has a very good reason to challenge the proposition that we have knowledge of causal powers or knowledge of causes qua causes. Now, let's consider Locke first, as Reed understood Locke. This is a quote from Reed. Locke would have our concept of power formed either by sensations, seeing that heat will melt gold, for example, or by reflecting on the consequences of our own actions. Now, mere sensations in the absence of memory 
will not permit a generalized inference of that sort. This is a point that Reed wants to make. If you try to get out of Locke the idea that at the level of sensation you can inferentially come to the conclusion that A causes B, heat is always causing gold to go soft and to melt, that sort of thing. You can't do that by way of sensation alone. What else do you need? You need memory. You need to be conscious of the events that are taking place. You have to have some self-awareness according to which you understand these experiences to be your own. You begin to see how much mental equipment has to be in place even to draw the inference that A is reliably bringing about B. Are, are you following this? So, so Reed wants to take these theories literally, they're being advanced by those who suggest they're, they're, they're offering a scientific account. Well, is it a scientific account? Is it scientifically correct to say that repeated exposure at the level of sensation to highly correlated events will by itself sustain an inference regarding causal relationships between the two? And the answer to that is no. If you had no memory, there would be no knitting together of, of, of pairs of events of that kind. So Reed says, here one might ask Locke this, is it by our senses that we draw this conclusion or is it by consciousness? Is reasoning or inferring the business of the senses or is it the business of consciousness? See, he's talking about the senses and consciousness because in one case sensation, in the other reflection. Are we getting it by reflecting on our own mental operations? Neither answer is tolerable, says Reed. If the senses can infer one conclusion from premises, they can infer 500 and demonstrate the whole elements of Euclid. Thus, I think we find that Locke's own account of the origin of our idea of power can't be reconciled with his favorite doctrine that all of our simple ideas originate from sensation or reflection. If you could draw one inference on the basis of sensation alone, you should be able to draw 500 inferences. Reed saying that simply by looking at an awful lot of geometric figures, you ought to be able to infer all of Euclid's geometry, just at the level of sensation, which is rubbish. Well, Locke is trying to give an account of how we get the idea of a power. Hume insists that we have no such idea at all. And this is the way Reed summarizes Hume's position. Power isn't something we perceive through any of our external senses, nor is it something we are aware of through consciousness. There's no need for me to prove that power isn't seen or heard or touched or tasted or smelled. And it will be just as obvious to us that power isn't something we're conscious of, using conscious in the proper sense, if we bear in mind that consciousness is the mind's power to have immediate knowledge of its own operations. So he, Reed goes on to say, Hume saw this conflict and consistently maintained, we have no idea of power. Now, one reason why you're not all studying Thomas Reed is because Thomas Reed's directness, his utter accessibility, his resonance with core principles of common sense, carried by everyone 24 hours a day in the serious business of lived life, just doesn't look sophisticated enough to maintain close philosophical attention. That is to say, he doesn't seem to know how to go about confusing you. And that renders his entire position suspect. So what, where does Reed begin with a claim like this? Well, the first, the first body he consults is the known recorded history of the human race, and as best as he can tell, how human beings have been talking about things since the dawn of time. This is the only way we can get clear on what words actually mean. It's the way a linguistic community, call it homo sapiens, 
speaks among themselves. This matters. That is, we don't sit back and get our working vocabulary from seminar rooms, all due respect to the designers of this one. So Reed says, quote, no principle seems to have been more universally acknowledged by mankind ever since the first dawn of reason than that every change we observe in nature must have a cause. Another argument to show that all men have a notion or idea of an active power is that there are many mental operations performed by everyone who has a mind and necessary in the ordinary conduct of life which presupposes that we have active power. Would you like an example? Now, this isn't something I'm doing trial and error. Actually, before I pick up the papers, I'm wearing a heavy jacket, and it is warm in the room, I am fully aware of the fact that I have it within me to grab these papers and to create a bit of a breeze, all right? How about this, when you're three days old? This isn't trial and error. That is, one comes equipped. Reed, I think, would say, God knows how. I'm not going to say that. One comes equipped to deal with the exigencies of life, and at least for creatures as complicated as we are, with the developmental history that we have, Many things have to be in place before we could even begin to learn them. You wouldn't last long enough if you had to learn them. As he says in various places, providence alone has given us a readier means by which to adapt to what might be called the demand characteristics of a situation. He goes on to say, no reasoning is more fallacious than the inference that one thing must be the cause of another because the two are constantly conjoined, Hume's theory. He says, Reed says, day and night have been joined in a constant succession since the beginning of the world. But who is so foolish as to infer from this that day causes night or that night causes the following day? He goes on to say, a great part of book one of Hume's treatise of human nature is devoted to supporting this important doctrine and supplementary theses that are used in defense of it. But to refute them is difficult and appears ridiculous. It's difficult, please listen carefully to this. It is difficult because we can hardly find premises to argue from that are any more obvious than the conclusions we want to prove. Uh, I might ask you to parse a sentence like that. It's not an unclear sentence, but it does require some reflection. Unless you have the, the active power yourself of maintaining your attention, of engaging in some deliberative review of an argument, of understanding how the evidence adduced in support of that argument is strong or weak. Are you listening? Unless you have all these powers, you can't even begin a refutation of the claim. So what Reed wants to say is that the resources that you would need simply to, the resources you would need even to accept Hume's argument undermine the argument because those resources are precisely what a radical empiricism denies. I shall read it again. To re he's talking about the, the, uh, the doctrine and the supplementary uh, theses advanced by Hume in the treatise. To refute them is difficult and appears ridiculous. It's difficult because we can hardly find premises to argue from that are any more obvious than the conclusions we want to prove, you see. You, you, you're already presupposing what the theory is denying as a condition of weighing the theory. 
Now, Reed's essays on the active powers of man were published in 1788. And here he takes up something that Hume says with, with I think, considerable gusto on, on, on Hume's part. Hume discovers that we have no idea of what a power is, and any time we use that word, the most we come up with are synonyms for it. Power, agency, efficacy, and so on. And he said, this doesn't explain anything. This is an attempt to explain X by giving it another, another name. And Reed doesn't take that up in the inquiry, but he does take it up later in 1788, where he speaks of the futility of searching for definitions of foundational concepts. This is a quote from chapter 1 of his essays on the active powers. Euclid, if we ought to trust his editors, tried to define straight line, unity, ratio, and number. But these definitions are worthless. Indeed, they may not even be Euclid's, for they're never once quoted in his elements, and as I say, are useless. So I shan't, I shan't try to define active power, and thus expose myself to the same criticism. The, the point being that if you're dealing with a foundational principle, it, uh, it, it, it is not definable. Because if you could define it in other terms, then those other terms would be the foundational principle. What the ancient Greek mathematicians referred to as a common notion, the starting point. If I say to you that a point is the limit of a line, and you say, prove it, all of the proofs that I would adduce presuppose the proposition. Do you see? So Reed's critique of Hume on power serves as a basis on which he will attack Hume on causation in general, and it begins with the ideal theory as found in Hume's statement in the treatise. This is Hume. This is Hume now. Quote, after the most accurate examination I am capable of, I venture to say here that the rule holds without exception, that every simple idea has a simple impression that resembles it, and every simple impression has a corresponding idea. You can satisfy yourself that I am right about this by going over as many of your simple impressions and ideas as you like. Close quote. Reed notes that as this can be no more than an inference from some small set of observations made by Hume, the framing of it as a universal law is simply a misapplication of the experimental method. Now against Hume's charge that power is never defined but only repeated in the form of synonyms, Reed exposes an utter inconsistency in Hume. Listen to Hume in the treatise when he gets to pride and humility. This is Hume on pride and humility. Because the passions of pride and humility are simple and uniform impressions, we cannot possibly give a sound definition of them. As the words pride and humility are in general use, and what they stand for are the most common passions of all, everyone will be able unaided to form a sound notion of them without danger of going wrong. Now, I don't want to conduct an opinion poll, but I think you probably have a much less cluttered idea when you use a word like causation than when you use words like pride and humility. This is about as common a notion as we have, that something's causally bringing about something else. That every effect has a cause is a first principle of common sense, and it's not to be set aside by a lately found theory, says Reed. Quote, Besides its having been universally accepted without the least doubt from the beginning of the world, it has this sure mark of a first principle. The acceptance of it is absolutely necessary in the ordinary affairs of life. And no one who didn't have this belief could act with ordinary prudence or avoid the charge of insanity. 
Yet a philosopher who has acted on the firm belief in it every day of his life thinks that it's all right to sit in his study and call it into question. Now, how do I want to have you understand this form of argument? First, is it ad hominem? It's not ad hominem. Is it something akin to to what uh, Locke endured at the at the hands of uh, Swift and Pope and so forth. I mentioned the Scriblarians to you. Have, have I talked about the Scribler? Is it that sort of thing? Well, I think stylistically it's something like the Scriblarians. And this I, I would have you understand to be Reed's really quite and famous gentle side. It's, it's a bit of a taunt, but there isn't anything hateful or, or hurtful in it. He has a worry that he expresses in the introduction to his inquiry, and the worry is this. Philosophy is too important a subject for the world at large to come to regard it as ridiculous. And thus, if there's going to be a collision between conjectures and theories generated by philosophers, and what every person of common sense must take to be the case as a precondition for life in the world as we find it. Everyone knows what the body count is going to look like there. It's philosophy that will be laughed out of the hall. Not because we're vulgar and stupid, but because the alternative is to try to live an unlivable life in reality. Just imagine yourselves going through life thinking that the only causal relations that actually obtain, obtain as your mere habits of thought. Evidence against Hume's account is abundant. We are daily aware of scores of effects for which experience supplies no visible or evident cause. Nonetheless, the principle is applied. And as for the origin, Reed offers this as a hint. <coughs> and I quote, If it is true, and I think it probable, that the concept of an efficient cause enters into our minds only from our youthful conviction that we are the efficient causes of our own voluntary actions, then our notion of efficiency or of making comes down to this. It's a relationship between the cause and the effect that is similar to the relation between us and our voluntary actions. Now what, what Reed is advancing here is a psychological theory, not unlike Hume's, which is also a psychological theory. Reed is saying that if we had no agentic power ourselves, if we had no awareness of ourselves as being the source of our own actions, no pair of events in the external world would ever give rise to the notion of a cause. Now just think about that. What is it you are imputing to external successive events when you impute to one of them the ability to bring the other about? You already have a developed sense of causation and you're now drawing the inference that that's what's at work in the external world. But what is the source of the idea you have of that? What Hume wants to say is that that idea originates in the external observation. What Reed wants to say is that no number of external observations for a creature lacking agentic power could ever give rise to the concept of a cause. Shall I say that again? You have a pair of events out there. Ball one moves, ball two moves. Do it 20 million times. But if you're a creature that at no cognitive, experiential, introspective level has the merest idea of causation, those external pairings will not produce it. 
it, it may produce some anticipation on your part, but not the idea of a cause. You may come to react to A as if B is now going to happen, do you see? Bell food, bell food, bell food, bell salivation. But if you were devoid of agentic power yourself, that ability to respond in an anticipatory way would never measure up to the concept of causality. So Reed wants to argue that the idea of causation probably originates in the recognition we have of ourselves as active, uh, as, as having agentic power, active power. What Reed means by an active power is the power to do or forbear from doing. So we have active power. Billiard balls don't have active power. They have power, but not active power. One billiard ball cannot forbear moving another billiard ball. But an, an entity without active power, having no more than external paired events to deal with, would never, never arise on Reed's account at the concept of a causal relationship. Reed is opposed to theories and conjectures that are not firmly grounded in the methods of Bacon and Newton. He is suspicious of armchair philosophizing. If you ever do get around to a serious inquiry into Reed's chapter of seeing in the inquiry, which gets highly technical, take, takes up subjects like squinting, cross-eye, the, the ability of animals with laterally placed eyes to see in depth, you see. Why is he doing all this? He begins the inquiry by saying that this idea theory, ideal theory, this notion that everything we claim to know begins at the level of some sort of sensory impression is a production of philosophers in the privacy of their studies, the, uh, it, in, including a philosopher who says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to treat mental life uh, as a science using the methods of Bacon and Newton. This isn't what Newton did. Get a telescope, get inclined planes, get brass balls. I mean, this, this is very difficult work. I think Reed goes into so much detail in the chapter of C as something of a lesson that if you really want to know something about how we come to perceive the world try this chapter for openers you'll see how difficult it is what is it that uh, that uh, uh, people know when they've been born with cataracts that have been surgically removed what do they see the old Locke Molyneux question a man born blind etc now, if you want these to be treated in a scientific way, you don't sit in a seminar room with uh, framing conjectures and theories. You go out and get yourself a significant number of people who were born blinded by cataract and at various stages after birth were the beneficiaries of successful cataract surgery and you do systematic studies of what it is they can and cannot perceive what it is they can gain by training, how much training is necessary. Look, you, this is, uh, you know, you might even apply for a grant to do these things. I don't know. I sometimes have a picture of Reed up there at Aberdeen writing an NIH proposal, having some fun with it. Um, so, Reed finally rejects a theory that would deny us uh, any awareness of causality until we observe events in the external world. But Reed also denies that we have knowledge of efficient causation. And that may sound surprising to you. And he, he refers to Newton. He says Newton makes the mistake only once in the Principia and quickly corrects it on the question of explaining gravity where Newton says in the corrected form Newton says mind you I do not know 
why it is that gravity causes things to behave the way they do. I know nothing about the cause. I simply have unearthed the laws by which the cause operates. You see? Newton can't tell you why gravity is having things move toward the center of the earth. But they do. There is an imaginable cosmos in which if you let a heavy object go, it goes up. Do you see? So Reed is not suggesting that in the scientific sense we have some immediate awareness of efficient causation. Now you say, could that be consistent with his view of active power? Of course. Look here. Do you think I know, or you know, how it is the desire to do this finally generates my doing it? You might think we know. You might think the neural sciences know. The brain sciences know. Do you think the brain sciences know that? The brain sciences know that I do have a motor cortex. They know that there are projections from that motor strip down the spinal cord, down something called the extrapyramidal pathways. They know that there are spinal motor nerves that exit the spinal cord on the ventral surface and feed the muscles and glands. They know that there's an anastomosis of nerves about here called the brachial plexus and that that's going to determine all of the movements in my arms and fingers. They even know that one of those uh, spinal nerves is responsible for two and a half fingers and a different one for two and a half fingers so that if I come in like this uh, it's traceable. This is all wonderful. This took a lot of time and a lot of study. How does my belief in my ability to bring something about get explained by the brain sciences? What's the pathway for a belief? What protein synthesis at the level of neural cells grounds conviction? Now look, I can bring in the A team and the brain sciences. They, they, they will give you answers. Thousands of Well, we know that. Of course, they don't know that. They know certain things that are correlated with being able to do X, Y, and Z. So you can't collapse the full panoply of mental, social, civic, moral, aesthetic life into the dynamics of uh, cerebral function. Yes, but you can't do any of these things without a brain. Well, what sort of an explanation? Yes, granted. Or seemingly so. So Reed says, look, we, we don't know how these things happen. We know that a caterpillar crawls across a thousand leaves until it finds the one that's right for its diet. Could it do it without a nervous system? Probably not. What is the neural correlate of the right diet? Well, it's certainly not some single neural correlate. I, I don't mean to uh, work, work, work this over to the point of tedium. Reed is satisfied that there are fundamental causal relations observable at the level of observation, but where the efficient causal mechanism is not known and probably is not likely to be known, these particularly with respect to mind-body relationships. The theory of consequence in Reed's time was David Hartley's uh, associational theory at the level of neurophysiology. Hartley was a, wrote a very impressive and influential book titled Observations of Man, which came out in 1748, picking up on certain notions of Descartes, Hartley arguing that the manner in which the nervous system operates is that we have this incredible collection of neural tubular, uh, an, an, a kind of tubular anatomy. And that what happens when we're stimulated is vibrations are set up in the fluid medium that runs through these anatomical tubes. Very tiny, minuscule vibrations. Hardly refers to them as vibrationcles. 
And this is a serious and sustained work. And, it's, and it, I, I regard it as a great work. Reed pauses and notes it and says, but what Dr. Hartley fails to tell us then is why we can't get thought from a pendulum. Now, wh wh why is he saying something like that? He's trying to get the mind back to recognize that nothing at the level of vibration, qua vibration, is likely to match up with something at the level of sentiment qua sentiment or abstract rationality or trigonometry. It, it, it may ultimately be worked out, but it's certainly not going to be worked out at the level of vibrations. Well, we don't talk about vibrati uncles any longer. When I was your age, I used to hate it when people began sentences that way. And I find now, whatever the audience, I actually can use that sentence. It's a remarkable thing. If you get old enough, you can say to almost anybody, and when I was your age, um, when I was your age, telephone switchboards. You know, the nervous system was very much like a switchboard. And then when I got a little older, it was um, like an analog computer, like a PDP-8. You don't know what that is. And then when I got older, it was a digital computer. Now it's an nth generation computer. In fact, the government of South Korea, if I'm not misinformed, is entertaining legislation that would make it a criminal offense to take lethal action against an nth generation computer on the grounds that you were destroying a rational entity. Well, today we laugh. T tomorrow the computer brings suit uh, <laughs> and is defended by an nth generation lawyer computer. Uh, but, 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 and, and, one, and, and one doesn't poo-poo these ideas. You, you want these adventurous, insightful theories to get an airing. What you don't want is to buy a pig in the poke. And, and it does make sense to take the Reedian route. What finally are the vibrati uncles about? They are about vibration, all right? So, so it doesn't matter if you say, and by the way, there are now 27 billion vibrating units. It's still about vibration. Now the question is, can vibratory patterns serve as templates for abstract rationality? That, that's then the question. Can, can vibrational phenomena code in some significant way the phenomenology of experience the Mary problem or something like that ah it's blue see. now if you say there's something at the phenomenological level that makes blue special of course this is a veritable invitation for the scientific community to say well the human retina has receptor cells called cones and they have different photopigments in them. In the old days we would call it cyanolabe and erythrolabe, etc. And cyan blue is just the result of decomposing one of those uh, pigments with light in a certain band of frequencies. And uh, those cone cells give a small DC response proportioned to the amount of photopigment bleached, generally one, one molecule of pigment will be bleached when the cell is hit by a photon or two, and those little DC signals then work as kind of generator potentials through other cells that then feed directly into a retinal ganglion cell whose axon is the fiber of the optic nerve. And that actually journeys to specific layers within the thalamus and color coding is achieved there. And so you see there's nothing miraculous about seeing blue. The anatomy is all worked out. You say, wait a minute. I didn't want to know how it is I see blue. I wanted an explanation for the phenomenological experience blue. Huh? Well, it, yes, well, of course, uh, on Russell's account, everything is a footnote to Plato. But, 
but it, but 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 this is this is this is in advance of Plato. This is about qualia, and what do you want to do about qualia? Well, you can do several things about qualia. You can say, hmm, there's the problem, or you can say, qualia, no such thing. Or you can say, I'm not quite sure what you mean when you refer to qualia. And, 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 you, and, and I've just generated three discrete bodies of literature in the contemporary philosophy journals. You see, one way or another, there's a group that says, no qualia, no problem. Another group says qualia, big problem. Another group says qualia, not sure what you mean. So there you are. I'll see you in a week.